Great. Uh, thanks, Ricardo. Um, thanks um, for organizing this great forum. Um, thanks for everybody uh, listening in. Uh, one of the few talks I felt really excited about giving, and I definitely know Sebastian uh, feels the same way. Uh, so our topic today is Gaussian process driven optimal autonomous data acquisition for large scale experimental facilities. And uh, we really want to put an emphasis on like a practical, uh, really practical um, introduction uh, to the subject. So let me first introduce what autonomous experimentation um, is, at least within that, within this talk. We can think of it as a closed experimental loop in which we have an instrument, which is in the top right here. This is for uh, many of you, a um, synchrotron light source. Uh, for others, it's, it's, it's a neutron source, um, but it can be a microscope um, or any sort of other um, experimental instrument we can, we can think of. And often the instruments, they have some knobs to turn, so they depend on some settings, some parameters. And then we have a sample, which is, which is being probed. And clearly the sample um, is clearly depends on, on synthesis parameters, processing parameters, um, environmental parameters. And often uh, this is a scientific challenge, finding out um, what happens with the sample across these different parameters um, and conditions. And um, on the other side, on the left-hand side, we have detector images. In this case, we're talking about a GSACS example, but for SACS, we get these beautiful images. Sometimes we get entire time series images, depending on the technique, sometimes we get spectra out of it. And whatever we get out of uh, the raw data can be thought of in a way as a function over all the parameters we stuck into, the, uh, into each measurement. And um, so, because obviously the, these images, whatever comes out, is going to change when we wiggle around those parameters. So we, we plug these images um, into a communication infrastructure, often cloud-based, and they arrive at an automated uh, data analysis, often dimensionality reduction. We're gonna see some examples of this where only a few numbers come out of it, a few numbers that, are, that encode what the information in, in the image. And then we send this off to an intelligent decision-making algorithm. Um, there we can think of stochastic processes, and this is what, what I'm going to talk about a little bit. But there's, for example, reinforcement learning, some you, you, you might have heard of, um, and mathematical optimization plays a role um, in a lot of them. So these intelligent decision-making algorithms, they now say um, optimally to gain, to gain information and to, or to um, hone in on some interesting material uh, character, characteristics, you should do this in this measurement. And that translates into a point of the parameter space. And this is send off to whatever makes the sample. And then the, and then the measurement is automatically triggered. And this is a closed loop. So that means um, ideally there doesn't have to be any uh, human interference throughout. Um, and I want to especially talk about um, using Gaussian processes for the intelligent decision-making um, and we have developed a tool, GPCAM, that is available to all of you. And in the next few slides, I want to explain on the really, really high level uh, what Gaussian processes actually do and how they help uh, in this autonomous loop. So when you come in the morning to your, um, to your instrument and you start your experiment, you don't know the model function yet. So here we see a, a ground truth model function. We don't actually know it in the beginning beginning of the day. Uh, here we are looking just at a 1D space, but it's just because the visualization is really simple. Um, but even though we don't know a lot about this function, we, we can say in a way what we expect from the experiment. We say measurements are probably going to scatter around um, what I call here a, a prior mean. And even if we are relatively wrong about this, when we define the prior, um, it's not that big of a deal because as we collect data, this prior is gonna be updated. But in the beginning we can say, they probably scatter around this prior mean, um, probably at a certain width. Um, that's all we know. And here what, I, what I've done is just drawing fun functions from this, from this prior mean. So we see the prior mean in, in the Gaussian process setting on the right-hand side. And I'm just drawing functions here and we see, those in, 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 we see them as the, these colorful um, curves. And in this, what, before we have even started data collection, all kinds of functions are possible to be the model function this day. 
Um, here, my parameter is, as an example, it could be an annealing temperature and the quantity of interest could be a grain size, but those are just placeholder for whatever you can think of. These are just examples. So let's start data acquisition. Uh, we see we have one data point. We have now a posterior mean in blue. We can again draw functions and we see it's already informed. So we're already starting to narrow down what functions that they could be our final model function. And we keep collecting data and can more and more narrow down. We already see again in the, 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 um, the skinny blue line, our posterior mean, our current best guess, and in gray, our uncertainties. Uh, the trend is already right after only four measurements. We keep doing this and we draw now from the posterior. So the other colorful um, skinny lines, they are drawn from the, from the posterior. So what is in fact informed by the data. And we can keep doing this. We see the function gets better and better closer to the brown uh, thick, ground truth line and we can do this and we keep collecting data until, and this is now after 40 data points, the posterior mean is where we have a lot of data um, is very similar to the, to the um, two hour ground truth. Um, this is also noisy data. So for example, in this image, we see the posterior mean doesn't have to go through the data because it is noisy. And this is in the end, all that a Gaussian process is, we are trying to, um, condition a prior and get an uncertain view of the model function across our domain. And we can use that information within acquisition functions where we use our best guess, we use the uncertainty and we use what we really want from the experiment, plug this into a mathematical function optimization. We see it here, which leads us just to the maxima and those maxima in, are just communicated back to the instrument. And we make sure that every single measurement we collect is in fact very, very valuable. And so that we don't do this completely erratically and jump from one edge to the other, but uh, economically, we can actually define cost functions. So we make sure that every jump makes sense um, so that we minimize costs like time or, or material costs. And this is all I wanted to say. Um, and I'll let, I give the floor to Sebastian talking about an example of where this was used. And I'll stop sharing. All right, let me share. Ah, uh, and great. And great, okay. Uh, thank you, Marcus, thank you for that introduction. And yeah, it's my pleasure to be able to give an example of how we've used this in an experimental setting. The, uh, the project that I've been working on at Brookhaven is leveraging on Thomas experimentation to investigate non-equilibrium phenomena associated with the self-assembly of, of, of bilayer films formed by stacking individual copolymer layers. So to give you all just a flavor for what these materials look like and, and the type of space that we work in, is that really the, the sample geometry is a combinatorial library that varies in both thickness and composition. These are generated by, create, by, use, by using gradient synthesis to blade coat uh, gra thickness gradients of one copolymer, let's say lamellae forming copolymer. And then on top of that, we'll blade coat in the orthogonal direction, another, another thickness gradient of like a cylinder forming copolymer. Together, they form this library, which I'm showing an image below, I'm holding it in my hand of how the thickness and composition vary across the sample. Now, how we go to measure the data is we'll take these, or why copolymers and, and why the system in general is great for looking at non-equilibrium phenomena is that because copolymers, when you raise them above their glass transition, glass transition temperature, they'll start to self-assemble. And, and you can quench this assembly process at any point simply by lowering the temperature below the glass transition temperature. And what that does, it effectively freezes these materials in their non-equilibrium state so that we can image them and understand their morphology. And the way that we do that is we take the copolymer after we've quenched the sample, we'll infiltrate it to, with, metal, with metal oxides to generate, to generate these replicas, like what I'm showing in the SCM images on slide. This is a metal oxide replica of the morphology of the copolymer morphology that we have at this given time point. Now, the processing parameter space for this project is quite large. We've tried to simplify this as much as possible, but still the dimensionality we're working in is this five-dimensional space where it varies in annealing time, thicknesses of each individual layer, how you layer the materials. And so leveraging autonomous experimentation is a means to 
it means to uh, maximize every single measurement that we do. And that's how we've tried to implement it. And we've done this in a few different flavors. The first flavor is on the data acquisition levels. This is incorporated into that closed loop that Marcus was discussing, that we're doing transmission x-ray scattering, and we take the data that's related to the structural information of, of the given spots, and we'll send this to an automated data analysis, where we're extracting out in information based on the structure or these relevant signals that we're interested in so that we can send that to the decision-making algorithm which then selects the next data point to measure. And you can think of it that in one way that the data, that the data decision-making algorithm has lots of information based on the sample that you're currently measuring. And then it's minimized, it's, a, it's, a min, it's you know, taking into account the cost and it's moving along the sample. But you can also use this in another flavor as when you give the decision-making algorithm domain knowledge of the parameter space. So here, what I'm showing is a three-dimensional subset of that five-dimensional space where we we use a semi-supervised classification scheme to you know, convert every single data point within the space or a historical data set within the space to relevant information like what type of structure we expect to find in that region. For example, it could be aqueduct, which I've shown in blue, parapet, which look like these cylinders on top of lamellae, vertical line cylinders, or these crisscrossing networks. Using this sort of structural information, we can then train a Gaussian process model to then start to understand what regions of the space we expect to access certain structures. And then we can not only just use that information to inform the decision-making algorithm, we can also then use that information to start to look at parts of the space where we expect certain, certain things to occur so that we can find the most interesting features within the data set to explore. So one example of this is if we wanted to use look for this parapet morphology, we can ask, G, we can ask GBCAM to find the, the slice the, in this space that's you know, constrained in time and thickness of layer one and layer two, where we expect to find the highest likelihood of this morphology. And in the top right corner, what I'm showing is the prediction and the data points that are filled in or the actual experiment that we did at this time spot. Now the X is the prediction point that was given to us. And the model that we trained it on was only using a very small historical data set, about 2000 data points. And what we found is that the data we collected seems to match the prediction fairly well. And even when you start to gather more data and you start to refine these models and the understanding of the space gets better, the shape of the model will, will change. You can see that in below it in the version two where we've now trained this model over in over 10,000 data points. But the prediction that made that the 2000 data points is still fairly close to where we expect this rich, where we expect to find this aqueduct morphology, which is shown in that green X. And to the right of it, you can see that in that densely red, that's where we find really, really rich uh, parapet morphologies. Now, this is an example of how we used it to track a single morphology throughout this parameter space, but you can also use this across many different morphologies to understand trends within, your, within the parameter space. And an example of this would be trying to understand the thickness dependence at different time points in our, in our, in our parameter space. And this is now tracking not just that parapet structure that I showed you on screen, but we're tracking also the aqueduct morphology, the sort of two-dimensional coexistence, three-dimensional coexistence. And what I'm plotting in the middle is the likelihood that we will get this morphology at a given thickness. And on the right, as you can see, the historical data set from the previous data that we collected was used to train the model. In the middle, these are the model predictions. These are the means that Marcus was talking about. The, um, and for the blue trace, you can see that shaded out blue is sort of the uncertainty in the data that we expect at these given thicknesses. But the trends that we find in the train model seems to match the data that we collect after the experiment. So on the right, these SEM images are data our data to um, to validate the hypothesis given to us by the GP by the GP models, and they follow trends very well. So you can see that uh, at thin films over at the left hand side of the middle of the middle plots um, on the top on the top plot, we expect a two D coexistence at thin films. And as you go to larger films, GP cam suggests that we should get these parapet like structures, which is indeed what we see when we do those experiments. And then at later annealing times. We expect to see this aqueduct morphology to only form within a given uh, given thickness range, and indeed, that's also what we find in the experiment. Um, 
And so the question then is, you know, moving forward, how can we use all this information to do more advanced experiments? And what we're interested in is trying to take all the physical information that we've acquired so far and then inform that into the get into the decision making process so that you can have more advanced acquisition functions. So that instead of exploring regions where you already know a certain, mo certain morphology should be, be expected, you can start to explore regions where you only where you're observing a, sorry, perhaps a mismatch between the model and the actual data you're collecting. So you're, gen so you're actually gathering data in, in regions where it are improving your understanding of the space, not, not just redundant data within, uh, within the parameter space. The other, the other flavor that we're interested in exploring is trying to correlate all of the structural information that we've generated with material properties that we're now starting to measure in the space as well. So we can start to generate complex structure property relationships that connect these two different, um, these two that connect them together. So we'll, we just find region where we have um, lots of stru rich structural, uh, interesting structural features, but also those feed structural features that have excellent properties as well. And so, yeah, with that, I would just like to give a quick shout out to Massa Fukudo and Kevin Yeager at, at Brookhaven National Lab for, you know, being the PIs on this project and their guidance, and also to Marcus for all his help on these projects as well. And with that, I will pass it off to uh, the next speaker. Uh, so this is again, Marcus Noak, the first filling in for the third speaker, Peter Swart, who is part of um, LBNL and is, um, also part of a group at the ALS uh, called the BSIs B. And what's happening at that beam line, these are uh, two dimensional mapping experiments, but it's IR spectroscopy. So at each uh, point in, in the space, you create these um, high dimensional spectra and, and, and dimensional in that case means uh, you store them, I think by, by, 17, uh, by 17, 1700, um, points. So traditionally this is done by this is traditionally done by a, a raster scanning approach so this is 10,000 points 100 times 100 um, uh, commonly overnight and you come back and, and, and you see your model and um, if there are certain regions that are uh, not densely enough samples sampled you would you would get back um, focus on a region and uh, do a higher resolution in certain regions which is I think a relatively uh, a common approach. So the goal was here, and that started about this effort started about uh, two years ago to go away from this and to have um, a, a software, a whole framework and an infrastructure available to the user so that they can um, hit a button and run this experiment loop um, autonomously, um, going away from the raster scanning, saving a lot of storage uh, by minimizing uh, the number of measured points, uh, but also saving um, a lot of time, um, as, as we see um, on the slide. Um, so how it works, whenever a, a spectrum is, is uh, collected, and I was talking myself earlier about the um, automated data analysis, there is actually, there are uh, usually matrix factorizations uh, used to get a lower, lower dimensional representation um, of the spectra. Often PCA is used or uh, non-negative uh, matrix factorization. And then what is actually uh, steered by the Gaussian process, and in this case, uh, the tool uh, GPCAM is actually uh, the similarity to base spectra. And, and as we see, this works uh, really, really well. Um, um, the required data amount has been down to um, often 5% of the original data re required. And um, the average data acquisition time went from uh, nine hours to to about one hour. And that is available to the users um, at that beam line now. It is, that is a, a really, um, this is used, uh, I, I, I believe heav heavily used uh, and it leads to great results. In addition, earlier I was uh, talking about acquisition functions and how acquisition functions can really be uh, used to not only go to regions where we don't know a lot, where the uncertainty is high, um, since the uncertainty is defined across the entire domain, but it can also be used to put all kinds of uh, uh, goals of the overall experiment in, into, the, into the experiment loop. And in this case, it is now um, available to put reference spectra of certain materials, for instance, uh, carbohydrates, I think the example you see on the right-hand side of, of the slide, 
And you can put those reference spectra in, and then in the acquisition functions, you use the uh, components to recreate the spectrum um, or spectra at different points and go to regions where this material is likely to exist. And so you can map out regions in, in this example where, for instance, there are a lot of carbohydrates and really hone in on those areas. Um, and so in these cases, experiment time was often even reduced to about to often 30 minutes and um, sometimes or often 200 to 400 points collected were actually enough to reach a scientific conclusion compared to what was normally would normally be the blind raster scanning of 10,000 points. This is pretty much um, as much as I can say about this project. I'm happy, we, we are happy, we both are happy to take questions. <laughs>